I want to ask you for your permission. If in, in your thoughts, the spirits already know that we're coming and asking for permission, saying that we're coming and asking for the spirit's permission to enter the river. The land is one land for all. There are no continents, there's no separation, there are no countries for the earth. But we believe that we are thousands of years. We've been here for thousands of years. That We know that we've been here for millennia. When we go to a place, a land, we pray first to see whether we have a connection to that place, to the earth, the land. It is okay with our way of life. And in the dreams, it doesn't always appear. This place where there's water and a spring, clean water, good water, it is sacred for us because everything is here. Nyande Europa. Everything we have, Nyande Europa, our planet. And it's not money, and it's our way of standing and stepping on the earth. It has life. We planted some cocoa trees. Here's my home. See, this is my humble abode. This is my solar panel. Pirapire is money. But people always say, don't change your head because of this little piece of paper, money. But you have to know how to deal what it is, to know what it means. What is the value that it has? It, is it life? Or does that, is that what makes sense in your life? Where we live, we always say that the plants, the animals that live in the forest and the stones, everything that is around us is part of our family. Everything that we do, that's where it comes from. We believe that it, the earth hears what we are saying. It doesn't speak, but we feel that it is speaking to us. Human beings need to understand plants for plants to be able to understand humans. The Ministry of Tourism and Casa Azul Association are now presenting the 19th Parachi International Literary Festival. Flip. The project has benefited from a federal law for incentives for culture. It has official sponsorship from Itaú Bank and the Valley Cultural Institute. It's organized by Casa Azul Organization, the Special Secretary of Culture, and the Ministry of Tourism. Nyeri Gera. Literature and plants, naturalism and violence, leaves and verbs, plants and cure, micelia, technobotanies, threads of words, utopia and dystopia. This roundtable is live and broadcast in three different channels on the internet. 
the original audio, Portuguese and English. Please choose at the bottom your choice of languages. Ask questions to the authors throughout the broadcast through the chat box and YouTube. And at the end of the table, some of the questions will be addressed to the speakers. We wish you all a wonderful flip. Good afternoon to you, the audience that's listening. The 19th edition of the Parigi Literary Festival. I am Prisca. I'm a poet and professor of Italian and comparative literature at the Federal University in Juiz de Florida. And I'm really happy to chair this second roundtable of this first day of FLIP after an inaugural roundtable, a splendid one. Today we have with us the bot Italian botanist of international renown, Stefano Mancusi was born in Italy in 1956, the director of the International Laboratory and Neurobiology of Plant Neurobiology, a member of the International Society for Plant and Behavior and a full academician of Deodorf, published numerous articles on the neurobiology of plants, translated and then published into many different languages in Brazil. There are two publications by Stefano Mancuz, The Revolution of Plants, The New Model for the Future from 2009 and The Plants of the World 2021, both by Umbra uh, editions and publications. Welcome, Stefano. It's a huge pleasure to be here with you. I would love to be in person at FLIP, but it is an honor and a privilege to be able to participate in a discussion which this discussion Obrigada, Stefano. Teremos oportunidade para justamente nos aprofundar nesse tema. Conosco na mesa está também o escritor, professor universitário, ensaísta... professor. Autor de vários livros de ficção, entre os quais destacam-se Cantos do Mundo, de 2011, pela Record, foi finalista do Prêmio Portugal Telecom. In Portugal mais... Telecom, e mais recentemente, o oficial SI e o Diário de Invenção de 2021, do Circuito Publishing House, como um essay. Ele tem numerous publications. Evander has just launched his book, Plant Thinking, Literature and Plants, by Civilização Brasileira, a publishing house where he also heads a collection on essays in literature, philosophy, and arts. Welcome again, Evandro as well. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, one and all. And good evening now. It is a huge pleasure. And I thank Flip and the organizers of Flip and everybody. Unfortunately, I can't name them one by one, but it would be a huge pleasure if I could. I want to thank my colleagues, the curators and the curator Anna Dantes from Sao Paulo. And uh, Uh, assim, o tem sido as a coordinator. He's been the coordinator of this curatorship and also Petro Neira, who is a president who teaches at Princeton. So it's a huge pleasure to be here with you. A poet, a sensitive and brilliant essayist. And Stefano Mancuso, it's a huge player and honor because he is one of my references in his research on plants. I'm not a botanist. 
I'm from the area of literature in the areas with which I work, and I use his work and that of other colleagues. So my idea is in no way to do a discourse as scientific knowledge, but in Parachi and living in Rio, I consider myself a child of Nyeri, this Guarani word for the Atlantic Forest. I was born in Southern Bahia in the Atlantic Forest. The cocoa, the cacao region, cacao is a migrant plant. It came from the Amazon and it was acclimated until the 1980s in the cacao region. And there was a pest there and it's been difficult for it to adapt to Southern Bahia. So I feel back to my own land as the child of the Atlantic Forest. I've lived elsewhere in other countries as well, but this is a unique opportunity to speak from the moment and when for the first time, indigenous people who are the original peoples are having visibility as never before. The opening today was after Mauro Munoz, the artistic director of FLIP. It was a beautiful ceremony, the Guarani ceremony. So thank you very much, one and all and especially to the audience who are attending, without whom, without these people who can see us from various different places. So thank you very much. And it was very moving, the opening. In fact, so let's begin now with this round table, an attempt to have two people's literature and plants. So I propose an initial question for us to begin to get into this universe, this crossing of plants and literature. And I can begin with a question for Stefano. If you recall, Stefano, the elements or the moments in your personal history and intellectual history that uh, led you to this area of research. Yes, I recall quite well. I should say that my love for plants, especially for a person who was not born in a completely plant uh, environment. It's totally different from the indigenous populations, indigenous peoples who already have a, an immediate proximity to the power of the plant world. But for someone like me and like the majority, we could say in the Western world, who are born in cities or in urban environments and urban settings, the love for plants is something which happens in the adult in adulthood. In other words, what I mean to say is that children almost always like animals more than plants because animals are very similar to us. They're easily understood. An animal can be understood immediately whether they feel pain or pleasure, if they need something, because animals are exactly like us. Meanwhile, not plants. Plants are a life form that is completely different from us, so different that, for example, in our history, when we need to depict life forms, alien life forms, extraterrestrials, we always depict extraterrestrials as animals, basically good, but either animals or humans or in, giant insects or reptiles, etc. Because this is the only kind of life, conception of life that we have, but plants are a superior life form which have characters of complexity, strategy, capacity, cognition, which is no different from ours, but which they've chose a different way, the animal way. So going back to your question, my love for plants, for me personally, I believe that this is very common it happens in adulthood because it is a love, an adult kind of love, a love which involves logic, involves thinking, because we can truly understand 
for us to understand what a plant is, we need to know how it functions. We need to understand how the plant is able to imagine, feel, and think. Because otherwise, without knowing that, we're going to continue using the term plant or vegetative, like a vegetative state of life. I think in most languages, people say a vegetative state, which means a state in which the environment is not perceived anymore. It's no longer possible to communicate with the environment. This is madness. It's exactly the opposite of what actually a plant actually is. A plant is a being, an incredibly more sensitive being, really sensitive in the sense that they perceive the environment and surroundings more, much more than any animal. And to understand this, it's necessary to have the idea of how a plant is constituted and how it functions, why a plant is so much more sensitive than an animal because we animals solve all our problems through movement and shifting displacement. We don't need to be especially sophisticated in our perception of the environment. For example, if I hear in the room where I am, if I hear or perceive that there is a fire, I'd get up and flee. But a plant can't do that. A plant has one single possibility for survival, which is to perceive that something is changing in its surroundings way ahead of time as compared to animals. So it's just a minor example just by way of illustrating the fact that if we don't understand this kind of life, neither can we love it. So I believe that the two things are connected. We love what we understand. We love what we understand. Otherwise, if we can't understand, we can't love. So for me personally, my moment or transition or passage was during my PhD work. In other words, already in well into adulthood, it was in my research at this time of research, I understood that plants are something different. That's interesting. Okay, we'll talk about this during one of the questions more specifically on your essays. Now I would like to address the same question to Evander and ask him about in your career in the field of knowledge, how did you reach this field of research and especially how did you conceive this concept of thinking literature with regard to the universe of plants that appears in your recent essays? It's interesting because my path is totally different from that of Stefano Mancuso because I was born in a rural area in a small city called Camacan where there's an indigenous tribe that was decimated from the 19th and early 20th century. The first half of the 20th century has happened and still happens here in Brazil and as a tribute to this tribe, which there are still a few members of the name Camacan Gate was given to the town, curious of the tribe, Debray, the French painter who migrated to Brazil, he painted the chief uh, of the Camacan prepared for a festival. He had contact with the Camacan, in other words, so I spent 14 years of my life in the rural area. I studied there my early years of my training and schooling. My father was a farmer. He had been a poor farm, a rural worker after he had his own land with my uncle. And so we went to the farm a lot and we lived an entire year on the farm. Exactly. It was called Forest. It was Floresta or Forest in Portuguese, the name of the farm. The first chapters of my book, I talk about this childhood in the forest. So I feel a child of the forest and a child of the Atlantic forest, as I said. But curiously, I wasn't curi intellectually curious. My head was very urban. I visited big towns, Salvador, Rio de Janeiro, and visited these big cities. So my urban experience, and now I return in advanced adulthood and to study in greater depth the issue of plants. So I'm going to be brief because it would be a long and drawn out story, but it's curious that people begin to ask me, but how did you reach plants? 
a bookseller who said, how did you reach this topic? Because he knew that I was a university professor and a writer and an artist. And he didn't see the connection with the plants. So these plants, which already generated the theme for Flip. What kind of Flip is it about? Literature and plants. Nyeri, Nyeri. It was an impact. You created difference, calling attention to this issue, the plant issue, where Mancuso also mentioned. I'm going to talk about it a little bit as a reader of his. I've read other scientists as well. So my issue, I think, at 16 years of age, is the issue of humans, the problem of humans. Reading Drummond's poetry in the word extrapolations on the word man. What is man? Is that a geography, a fable? And the poem asks that question. But is there a man? This question for an adolescent was highly, heavily, had a heavy impact because a poet with a sen poetic sensitivity, it's a plant sensitivity. Drummond was totally a plant poet and very animal as well. We're animals and plants at the same time, like Drummond, the poet. Based on that, I began to speculate. My intellectual life was about humans. Nietzsche, beyond humans, impacted me in the limits of humanity, not overcoming. I'm not anti-humanist. I continue with the humanist tradition, philosophically speaking. I have this background in training. My training was in literature, but I spent five years in French. And it, and the student of Jacques Derrida, Derrida. So for five years, I studied philosophy and I still read philosophy and I work with philosophy and with great pleasure as well. So to summarize the story and make a long story short, in 2012, I did my first book on Clarice Lispector and animals and things, objects. And there's a chapter there which is about plants in Clarice Lispector and the seed of research that I conducted starting in 2017 systematically. In other words, what interests me and what interests me still in my plant thinking is this category, which is with the research starting in 2017, has to do with this questioning why men, to use the term in dialogue with Mancuso, he just said, he talked about the plants love. Okay, what we detected it was phytophobia, in other words, horror of plants, the need, human need to destroy forests, to destroy the fields, to devastate, to plant monoculture. And this is what we see in Brazil and that we see in other countries as well. So this horror for plants or phytophobia and my increasing love, because as I learned more and researched the field, this field of knowledge, reading, I didn't want to just stick to philosophy. I could have couldn't have dialogue just with philosophers. What Mancuso just said was a knowledge of the structure of flowers. We're going to give a simple examples, like we ignore. Another day, an artist, I'm not going to say the name, in his social network, he confused pollen with nectar because the flower produces pollen and nectar. And it's a common confusion. People don't have a notion of the difference between pollen is a male element, it fertilizes the feminine of the same flower or other flowers. Meanwhile, nectar is a water and sugar that flowers offer. It has a function, but one of the functions is to attract the possible pollinators like bees and to fecundate and fertilize when the insect like bees have contact with the nectar. They also have contact with the pollen and they take the pollen to another flower. This is a minimal basic example of people's ignorance concerning plants, which I had myself as well. And I read botanists, but not a special botanist Mancuse, Francis Le, Jean Marc Epel are researchers that are open to uh, renewed botany. Not, the neurobiology of plants is amazingly daring, of course. It's not the neurobiology of animals, but it's a reflection based specifically on the field of botany and a botany which is open to this sensitivity and this vegetation plant intelligence. This was what surprised me most in plant thinking that I worked on in my entire book. And they give the title to the book is related to thinking literature in a brief summarizing and making a long story short and reading these two categories because I took the entire book to write this to connect the two things. For me, thinking, thinking is not an act of reflecting or having ideas, just it's that as well. But it's precisely the capacity that we have or not 
to relate to other others, plant or animal others. So thinking literature is a literature that is produced by authors, men and women, not just Western or non-Western, whether oral literature or written literature, where there is a sensitivity, not simply using animals and plants as symbols, but a sensitivity, a connection to this world of the other living beings. This for me is a thinking experience. So literature, thinking literature is the one that connects in the through discourse with the nonverbal discourse of plants and animals. So, but today our topic is plants. So summarizing, that's it. And that was the contribution from science, the sciences, biology in general, but botany specifically. Okay, excellent, because in fact, I was going to ask you about the botanic and Stefano as well, to try to understand the extent to which these two areas, literature and botany and human sciences and exact or hard sciences contributed to your training. You already talked about this. I reached botany to be able to have this backing to know the limits of humans. Stefano, perhaps human sciences, they contributed to your path. When you read your essays, we have this clear perception that your essays, although they clearly have this scientific approach, but they have a appeal and a pleasurable appeal, which is not, who are not scientists, the readers that are not scientists, so there's a pleasure in reading your work for me. I would imagine that for many people as well, it leads us to a field of human sciences as well. So my question that I would like to address more directly to you, to what extent the human science has contributed at this time of your PhD when you became and turned to botany? Fine, basically, well, my love for plants came late in my life and late in adulthood. My love for literature and arts happened very early. I was a voracious and early reader, and I still am a voracious reader. I consume. I'm a born consumer of books, essays. Uh, the greatest pleasure in my life is to be able to read and study. And especially in my great love, the greatest love of all is for literature. For me, there's no form of art or skill or capacity, perfect one in the world, which is superior than the great writers, writing literature, that's the greatest. I highly value and admire all kinds of art, but literature for me was crucial. Literature has the great capacity to open you up to open you up to different worlds, worlds different from your own. I believe that any reader must have felt this, but when you read War and Peace, you become part of the bourgeoisie, and the Russian aristocracy, of which we knew nothing about. And we live reading books, so we enter into a different world. So readers, True readers are people who have no walls in their minds, who leave the barriers of their mind down. They take down the barriers in the wall, totally permeable to new ideas, new visions, new perspectives. And this is fundamental, crucial. The great scientists cannot do anything more than also being artists. In other words, having the instinctive understanding of the world without which you cannot be a good scientist. You can never be able to be a good scientist without that. So much so that one of the greatest problems that I see with all of my researchers 
is precisely their limited capacity to grasp fields that are not typically scientific. There I see a major limitation. It's very difficult, very complex, normally for scientists. They spend virtually their, all their time reading scientific literature, but scientific literature, no matter how precise and how much it represents a method on which I dare say nothing against it, but it is a method which does not allow or does not give access or rarely gives access to new ideas, really, truly new ideas, a change of perspective. Let's put it in these terms, to view the world and glimpse the world through a profession and then move to another position, totally from one position to another. This is typical of artists, not typical of scientists. And to be a good scientist, I would repeat, it's necessary to be also, to be a good scientist, you must be somewhat of an artist as well. And in this sense, over the course of my career, in addition to my love for literature, which I confess, Prisca, which probably would take more time than my scientific studies. It takes more time. Despite that, I also created many relations with writers and artists from very different fields. For example, just to cite a Brazilian artist who had a major influence on me and based on the continuous discussion and ongoing discussion that we had, never several new perspectives emerged. I don't know if you know, Luis Zebini, I imagine you know Luis Zebini is a painter, incredible Brazilian painter, Brazilian painter, Luis Zebini, whose theme recently, in recent years, he was always a representative of nature. He depicts nature with characteristics that are very contemporary characteristics, obviously and his representations, for example, of the Atlantic forest, for me, were essential. And he was the one who taught me a technique that I also use today, which is monotypy to reproduce plants, to be able to study them. If I didn't know, hadn't met Luis Zepini and I hadn't seen the world that from his point of view of monotypical representation, I would not have had the possibility of understanding some truths which later I found in the scientific world. So I don't know if I'm talking too much. You can interrupt me if necessary, but the idea, the question that you asked is fascinating because we are at a moment in which there is a discussion, a global discussion on the importance, for example, of the study of ancient language and the study of literature and the history of philosophy. Yesterday or day before yesterday in Italy, our minister of ecological transition said that we don't need to study the Punic Wars, enough of the Punic Wars, I think this is madness. I believe that the beginning at the end of our civilization, our civilization is based on the unity of knowledge. Our problem, one of the problems of humankind is to move away from Having a fragmentation of knowledge is, and this certainly led to many results in many fields, but also led to a loss of richness and biodiversity. Actually, it's interesting because your answer brought a number of reflections that I already wanted to propose to you and to Evando. Just one thing to add, it's very interesting because the cover of the book 
was done by Zerbini this year. So interesting coincidence. The cover. Keep a copy for me. When I saw the cover of the catalog for Flip, I said, man, it looks like Zerbini's work. And now I understand. It was Zerbini that made the cover for the catalog for Flip. Picking up on the answer that Stefano said, Evando, I would like to ask you a little bit, picking up on this issue of a certain urgency of looking at contemporary issues. It's very frequent that for us writers here, I'm considering all of us as part of uh, writers were instigated and urged to answer questions like what can literature do today, given the world that we have here of catastrophes. We don't even have to list all of them. They're humorous, numerous catastrophes. And I'd like to ask you, based on your study, a long study on the relationship between literature and plants, how could you answer this from the perspective of your field of research? How do writers answer this question? What are the answers that writers can give? What is the role of literature given, for example, the current insensitivity to e ecology and the plants in general? I believe the contribution is huge. I agree totally with Mancuso when he says of the need for connection of different kinds of knowledge. This interrelationship, not only interdisciplinary, but transdisciplinary as well. It's interesting that I am from a generation trained by Foucault and Derrida that suspected and distrusted sciences, sciences, sciences and the positives. You only read science, as he just said, scientists who are not open to other sensitivities, artistic sensitivity, for example. And it was a joy to learn that there are scientists like him and others that were very useful in my research because I felt entirely at ease to engage in dialogue first because they write the writing that they have for the general public is very literary. They're well written components, very pleasant to read, and a lot of information at the same time. So it's pleasurable to read. Of course, there's a part that's more difficult the details and the plant structures and their functioning, the plants specific sensitivity, etc. etc. So has ever since very early, as I said, had this plant experience in that I grew up in the Atlantic forest. All I had to do was make a connection. And when I discovered the science, another science, which is that, that of science only focused on the industrial world, you know, techno science, bioscience, only for to produce merchandise and commodities based on plants or animals, but precisely with the desire that he demonstrates in his research of real knowledge of this sensitivity and this intelligence. As he just said, the plants have a distributed sensitivity throughout their bodies. They don't have a brain that's going to process like animals do the sensation that comes from the body, but they have a sensorial uh, uh, nature distributed throughout their bodies. I connected easily in the field of literature. The more you read, the more you discover how the vast field of literature that you connect and you read with other eyes without realizing that these authors were already in dialogue, they were already bringing the language of plants to their literature far long before this theme emerged. What I mean to say is the following, the critical literary theory took a long time to discover what the writers have done ever since the ancient Greece and writers and indigenous Orators have always done, the uh, Asians have always done the, in this interlocution between the plants, this opening. So in poetry, especially, but in fiction as well, this openness and in the plastic arts, this uh, dates back to the origins of humankind. There's nothing new to but but philosophy and literary theory. Only now they're discovering this fully because literature, as I said before, the plants was simplest, symbolic, and it didn't appear the understanding, the intelligence, intelligence brought and introduced in literature itself. I don't want to talk only about, I want to be a ventriloquist with the voice of the plants, the plant voice, the plant voice of the sap through my brothers and sisters, which are the plants, 
and the writers and men and women. So now I'm going to read two authors, one author, a man and a woman who were fundamental in my research. I think it's important to uh, quote them. I'm going to contemporary ones. I'm going to begin with one is Brazilian from uh, with a Ukrainian first lady, the specter. Uh, water, living water. It's a plant and animal book. It's a true forest. It's a, a agua viva. The sunflowers slowly turn their flowers to the sun. The wheat is ripe. The bread is with, eaten with sweetness. My impulse connects to the roots of trees. That's beautiful, isn't it? So there's a moment where the narrator says, talks about her desire to become a plant. She identifies entirely with plants. She says it has roots and hairs and foliage. So it's a veritable plant woman. She's anonymous. She's a painter or a writer at the same time, totally lost in this forest, in the jungle, which, which I would call phyto writing. I created this word. I created several different neologisms with for phyto literature, phyto poetry, phytophany, which is love for plants. And I use poetically over the course of this book of essays, another poet that I'm calling Clarice, a poet as well, Clarice Lispector, translated into several different languages, including Galliano, I don't know, a wonderful writer. Uh, Ladies, the inspector, an animal sensitivity. She identifies both with panthers and as a rose or an orchid, etc. So now, Alberto Cairo, who is a veg plant heteronym of Fernando Pessoa. So he asks the following Metaphysics, what metaphysics do those trees have? Uh, they're green with crowns and have branches and giving fruit at the proper time which does not, we do not know, give to them. It's to know, we don't know how to know them, to know the trees. And he asks, what kind of metaphysics physics do plants have, but what better metaphysics than plants metaphysics do not know why they live or know what they don't know. So this book, which is Guardador de Rebanhos, Fernando Pessoa is one of his heteronyms radical questioning of humanness, uh, shifting of anthropocentrism. There are biologists and botanists who say two centerings, the lowering that the plants have suffered, and anthropocentrism and zoocentrism, a large part of biology was assembled on a biology focused on animals and especially uh, and humans. So the brain is some, something phenomenal, and since plants don't appear to us, they don't have eyes, they don't have hands. The animals have something, their paws that remind us of our own limbs and our eyes and their snouts or muzzles are like our noses. So this narcissism of ours with animals and we identify with them, but not plant. He talked about vegetate. I studied four languages. I didn't study in Italian, but it's probably the same issue in Italian, which is vegetate. It gained this sense, this negative sense of vegetative sense, or vegetate, vegetate, vegetate in English. All of them had the same sense of a life, which is not a life. Somebody is vegetating and somebody is in a coma. But I went to the Latin root, and in Latin, it was entirely different. The verb in Latin means to animate, give life to. It would be interesting to do an etymological or lexicographic study at what point in Western civilization the non-Latin languages transformed the sense of the verb, Latin verb in the opposite sense, in the sense of death, in the sense of inertia and coma. At what moment in culture this happened? This has to do with the history of the West itself. And I know that there is this lowering, a demotion in the plant world. So these authors, these plant authors, the floral authors, they have this vegetal life to bring it to us and they help us. I'm going to be talking more about art since very early. I met the Vanguard when I was 12 years old and I thought I was like a 
sunflower, a plant man. This wrote about this writer, about Van Gogh, Van Gogh, on his letters and his correspondence is a beautiful part in Van Gogh's with he perceives that he's being recognized as a painter, painter of sunflowers. He was in saint Remy in Provence in the asylum. He said, I manifest the desire to be acknowledged as a painter of cypresses, a typical vegetation of that. He should also be acknowledged as a painter of the olive trees because he has magnificent painters of the three plants olive trees, cypresses, and sunflowers. So this artistic sensitivity and the sensitivity, so to speak, which is not separate. We have the, we separate everything, intellectual capacity, scientific curiosity on the other side, and artistic curiosity on the other side. These writers, they combine everything. So like the indigenous people, the indigenous people don't make the separation. Knowledge of plants is a knowledge which is in their body. My colleague, Jean-Paul Barreto, he has a PhD in anthropology. He talks about the plant body, our plant body. We deny this legacy, this plant legacy. We are feed, fed on plants. Even people who meet, eat animal meat were eating herbivores who ate the plants. So we're nourished by plants because we don't have the capacity to do photosynthesis to produce our food from the inorganic. It's the plants that do that. Without them, we lose nutrition. We lose protection, and we lose also oxygen and the climate regulation. And there's so many other things which these living beings give us. Uh, they give us free simply because they exist. And our sisters, the plants, our sister plants, concluding, it's a beautiful expression in Shinkaedu, rather than Heidegger, who separates rather than Descartes, who separates completely. Human beings and plant beings and animal beings are sisters, are the plants. The saints that no one prays to, and nothing more sacred today than vegetation, because it is what guarantees our survival on the planet. It's difficult for me to share this, because this unfolds in infinite directions, in spin-offs, in ripples. There's so many questions. Many more questions, but let's try anyway. I'd like to ask you something that I think is also extremely interesting to attempt to cross analyze the work by the two. And I believe that both in the essays by Mancuso and by Evandro Nascimento, there's a perspective that I'd like to call almost utopic. utopian. It doesn't mean that it's not achievable. I'm going to explain better what this means. In your essay, Stefano, in the lesson that the plants have the uh, Italian version here, it is a poetic text and lyrical without denying its scientific nature. It's a letter on the rights of living beings written by the plants, i.e., you give voice to the inhabitants of the plant nation as if it were a human nation, but inverting the view or perspective. Could you tell us a little bit, Stefano, about this letter and the principles and rights of plants, or rather, what new sensitivities are or would be inaugurated and launched based on this universe? I think it's still utopian. That's why I think there's a utopia there, and there's one of the common sensitivity caused by this reversal of perspectives. <coughs> Yes, Riska, like you, in fact, this conversation with Evando and with you is extremely interesting. I could also continue talking for hours on end about the issues of art and sciences, how they interweave and intertwine. But to recall, as you were recalling, when I wrote The Plant Nation, my idea was to imagine a constitution written by plants, because all constitutions on the planet, even the most beautiful ones, the most frequently cited, the most glorious constitutions, have already always based on humans. Humans as the base of constitutions on our planet Earth because the fundamental point 
of our interest is humans. But when I wrote this book, Plant Nation, I wanted to show that we animals are part, not we humans, we animals are part of a minuscule part of life and truly tiny part of life and all the rest of life, a enormous part of life, incredibly vast part of life behaves in a differently. So I would like to remind people who are listening because I believe that it is essential to recall this, the proportions of what we're talking about here. Animals all together, not only just humans, all animals together represent only 0.3% of the planet's biomass. In other words, if we were to weigh all the animals of the world, we would perceive that they represent only 0.3% of life. Plants represent 86% of life. And when Evando was recalling the division of the world by Descartes and Heidegger, this Cartesian division, Heideggerian division, the idea of superiority and ex human superiority and exceptionality, and uniqueness. I think that this is a point that philosophically speaking is untenable. Philosophically and scientifically untenable. Because if, let's take it as an example, intelligence. We consider that intelligence is the result of an organ. This organ is the brain. Just as kidneys produce urine, our brains produce thoughts. That's our notion. Intelligence is the result of an organ. But I'm not going to go into details if this is true or not. But let's think of the implications of this. If we say that intelligence is the result of brain, the brain's activity, this also means that only 0.3% of life is intelligent and that the rest, 99.7% of life, is consists of organic machines, in other words, things which don't think don't feel, don't have ideas, don't respond or solve problems. Obviously, to anyone, this position is uh, obviously false and weak. How is it possible to conceive of life which cannot solve problems? How is it possible to imagine a bacteria, not a beautiful tree, but a bacteria or virus? they also have to be capable of solving problems. Otherwise, they will be deleted from evolution immediately. Evolution doesn't allow survival of beings that can't solve problems. Intelligence is a characteristic proper to life. The fact that we appropriate this as if it were just ours is one of the most immediate examples, not so much of the anthropocentric view, but I would say of human stupidity, truly human stupidity, stupidity and lack of humility. Our species is incredibly young. We have only existed for 300,000 years. Homo sapiens appeared on this planet 300,000 years ago. Take this as the point of departure. Let us. Why do we see ourselves and we feel ourselves that better than other living beings? Why do we think that we are better? What does it mean to be better? Better means that we have an objective and a way of measuring efficiency with which we achieve that objective. If you and I, Prisca, have a competition in 
high jump again. You high, you jump 10 meters high, and I jump one meter. Fine, you're better. There are objectives that we can measure, but in life, when we say that we're better than all the other living beings, because we write the divine comedy, or because we produce the theory of relativity, this does not make any sense in evolutionary terms. The objective of life, the primary objective of life and that of humans is propagation, survival of the species. Our species, the first objective of life is the survival of the species. If our species disappears, the fact that we wrote Karamaz, brothers Karamazov, or we discovered the theory of gravity, nobody cares. That'll disappear with us. So the objective is survival. When we talk about this, we need to understand that there is a mean life. You know how long a species lives on the planet Earth. Mean life is 5 million years. And we humans have been here for 300,000 years. We truly think that we're going to be able to do we think that we can live 4,700,000 years more? I hope so. But do we really believe that? Let's say that at present, we don't have great evidence that we'll have such a long life as a species. Let's think that if we live 4,700,000 more years, we would be like the other species. We would be just average in that sense. We would have to live more to demonstrate that we're better. All the rest is that film says it's foolishness. So where this question comes on the utopian perspective, that may enter the much more than utopian. It's the emergency of surviving and having awareness of this. But going back to a question for Evando and announcing that we're entering into the final 15 minutes and the extra time. Evandro, I have a question for Evandro, a writer who wants to ask him, or more than asking, ask him for to talk a little bit about how he perceived in writers in the research that he did, this impasse between the impossibility of approaching as a plant, non-human sensitivity through a language, which is verbal. And actually, how he, as a writer, and an artist, I know that you're doing this, you propose a language which is a, it's close to plant writing. In other words, phyto writing, phyto poetry, in other words, as you know, and you have seen some things that I've written and posted on social networks. It was the first exhibit last year, but the pandemic prevented my exhibit. I resumed drawing. I used to draw in adolescence and painting and drawing. One of my fundamental themes in my research was precisely the relationship to plants. So I'm so open. I visited before the pandemic the botanical gardens, which is a phytotherapy as well, existential and plant therapy, because art and life are not separated one more. Western separation is between art and life. So now, and it's a political issue. By excellence, you talked about utopia and politics. It's survival and politics of this intelligence, which goes up, is in part of that because it confuses cognitive capacity with intelligence. We are truly exceptional cognitively, but in terms of intelligence, if we destroy ourselves, it's because of stupidity and ignorance. With regard to my work, one of the proposals that I do is what I call uh, writing and drawing, combining images with writing. It can be verbal writing, and it can be writing which remembers or recalls this, an alphabet. This image is extremely important for me because it is a leaf. I took a leaf on the street in Rio de Janeiro from a tree, an ornamental tree in Rio de Janeiro, and I did several different studies with this leaf. I interacted with with this living being. I don't like living beings with this live things. One of the things that I do is this mineralization, which is also fossilized, is to preserve life of the leaf through the fossil, which is the drawing. Drawing for me is a fossil. It's a realistic drawing because it leaves a mark, not a representation. I don't work with representation. I work with this idea of the print, the impression, the 
trail the plant tracks using graf graphite. Very interesting in this image with realistic life. It's very realistic, which at the same time I had this model. It's the size is real. It's the, the leaf was that size. And at the same time, I worked in the, it's almost legible. It's that I use, I take advantage of that because I want this writing to be semantic and what means sense and what doesn't make sense. And this interweaving in uh, Chinese engraving, Chinese engraving is one of my inspirations, but also the indigenous writing and graphisms which mix the world, animal, plant worlds, and the graphisms, abstract graphisms. So there's several different references and not one single reference. And this also breaks with the model of Western representation because in the West you have two classic forms of representation. Three, I would say the image, just the image, purely drawing, painting, with no writing whatsoever. And you also have two other representations, which are, for example, the subtitles. Subtitles, you have an image and you have a subtitle, which is subservient, which explains that image. So that is the text is inferior with regard. It's always only serving the image and you have the opposite, which is the illustration. We have a literary text, a poem, and the image illustrates and serves the purpose for the writing. It serves the purpose for, so to speak, the text. Okay, what I want, the inspiration was Chinese Oriental, the inspiration was indigenous, indigenous, Brazilian indigenous peoples, the Guarani, etc. And in a sense, uh, breaking with this classic representation. And I want to mix plants, so enter into dialogue. Like Louise Zabini does, of course, Zabini has a career uh, which is much uh, longer than mine. And uh, like and several different Brazilian artists, the part of my book, these artists are exceptional. And they use material, the residues from vegetation to do their sculptures and their paintings, etc. And my work as a writer, uh, as a phyto writer, phyto poet, and phyto fictionist, because I have short stories on plants as well, are focused on this interweaving of languages as if I wanted to. I don't like to talk for plants. I don't want to talk for the place of speech is being traversed and permeated. I'm a ventriloquist, my hands and my body, to draw with my body as the indigenous people do. You draw and you sing, you just dance. Sometimes I'm drawing, standing, listening to music, and I begin to dance on uh, the sheet of paper that I'm drawing on because I want for my body to enter and interact with the paper because it's a kind of language we have the plant uh, language. It's what we call given to plants in the West. The Western cultures is plant blindness. Plants are right next to us because it's a collective. We don't interact. We don't talk to the plants. We don't have the sensitivity, open sensitivity to talk to the plants. Or in other words, we create alternative worlds like the mythology of the last century or flower power and alternative society. That's not yet the idea now is to reforest the urban space to bring plants more into inside inside home for the parks and the gardens. Look how politically beautiful it is. Sao Paulo now has a park in the heart of the city. And it could have become one more skyscraper or a, a residential condo or gated community. The survival of the forces, the survival of the species. The Indians know that because they live, might have, have always lived in the forest and to preserve the parks and to create more and more green spaces in dialogue with the plants and with the animals, our brothers and sisters, to enter into brotherhood and sisterhood. Western philosopher even Heidegger created, criticized humanism. He was extremely anthropocentric. There should be an abyss. And he has the human living beings and other living beings. This is unthinkable, untenable. Now it's a time for the dissemination no longer deconstruction, but dissemination, which is a term, a botanical term originally, dissemination, it's to spread the seeds. That's something that Mancosa just said, the survival of life is your capacity to disseminate and to reproduce in survival. This is what intelligence is, it's not only having the theory of relativity or having uh, uh, one theory or another, but without this intelligence, vital intelligence, which which is in bacteria, it's in, in short, in living beings. Whatever is living is 
Uh, otherwise, we'll be destroying the planet. Talking about dissemination. Talking about dissemination. Let's pick up another tip of this process of dissemination, which is the educational process. And with this regard, I would like to address a question to the audience, but we have to be somewhat brief because we only have 10 more minutes to share between the two of you. But I would like to propose this question for you. I'm going to read it here from you. It came in from the audience, which is Professor Simone Peris, who is attending Canaan. Karajas from Para, Para. She thanked you for the round table and she congratulated for the interest in this theme and she asked a very specific question which has a deck with spreading a new perspective, spreading out. She asks from the state of Para, Karajas, how to take this approach to students in the classroom? What is the role of education in this sense? So perhaps I would begin with Evando this time after who I'll turn it back over to Stefano. The question is fantastic from a teacher. It's a crucial question. I think that the teachers, university teachers and teachers at all level, middle school and elementary school have a decisive role in this environmental awareness and consciousness. Plants, bringing plants into the classroom, bringing literature, which dialogue with the plant issue, the animal issue, and literature that I'm talking about in the broader sense. There's already, when I began to research this topic of plants, the bibliography and literature, scientific literature for a broader is small and limited. There's so many translations. There are Brazilians also producing the indigenous peoples. In the meanwhile, David Copenau, with whom I dialogue, and Ailton Krenak are thinkers, and not philosophers, they're thinkers. They're the utmost important in philosophers. You can be a philosopher and not be a thinker. And a thinker is someone who thinks alternatives so the children especially children are like seeds who need to take root and to take root in the proper sense they need to be cultivated and treated since the early age and presented to this plant universe so i think it's decisive to bring the text to bring images where you have on the internet zillions of images of plants documentaries, to watch documentaries with the kids about the indigenous peoples in Brazil, about the forest. The internet is a vast field that you can bring into the classroom if you have difficulty. So there are videos and books about all of this. So work working radically with this idea that thinking is produced truly through this interaction with others, with otherness. Without otherness, there's no thinking. That's where you don't vegetate. You'd be like, not like being immobile. You're thinking about minerals, rocks, inert matter is never inert. Inert matter vibrates. There's a book about this, The Vibrant, Jane Bennett. It's a beautiful book that shows that the things, everything vibrates in the universe. There is nothing properly inert. What interests me is not just the relationship to life, but the relationship between right and non-life is life and non-life respect for minerals. Extractivism is so destructive, it destroys the environment. So this awareness, which is no longer just ecological in the classical sense of the term, but it is an awareness of survival of the species because we can destroy the environments, the ecosystems, etc., and our species will be, become extinct, but we will not extinguish life. That's an illusion. Life cannot be extinguished that easily. The plants, the animals did this. You saw this incredible scenes in the pandemics, the animals occupying, reclaiming the spaces of the large cities. This is beautiful. It's our future. If we don't know, the plants are wise in that sense that cities are full of plants that take over. In other words, and when we, as long as we stand, Mancuso calls attention, our time is micro in the universe. It's a second. Humankind has existed for one second in the story of the planet, in the story of the universe. So what's going to be left in thousands of years will be our ruins occupied by the plants. If we don't make a decision now to preserve the vegetation and the animals, to preserve at least, not physically, our, physically our species, otherwise we will truly be the extinct species, that species which left a trail and tracks, but now it only exists as a residue, as ruin, there no longer exists as a living presence as life. So it's the role of teachers and professors 
indigenous or non-indigenous in all urban spaces and rural spaces to open up the sensitivity based on from childhood on for this to proliferate for throughout life. And I'm going to conclude by saying that our flip is for that. The story doesn't end here. The audience will continue to attend us because there's an incredible program that's coming in the next days. It's going to be the supplement of this seed that the Indians planted just an hour ago, and we're planting now. It was you were an exceptional uh, interviewer and uh, chairperson. Thank you very much, Evand, and I'd like to hear Stefano concerning this, the perspective of a botanist and a scientist in this interweaving between schools, which is our field of work and daily practice, not only in the university, I would say even more so in elementary school and even preschool, as Evando said, but what is your perspective on this, especially somewhat the view of Italy in this case, but also looking at your experience, so to speak, from the West and possibly outside of the West, what can we do as teachers? It's beautiful. We can do a lot. Partly following the suggestions that Evandro made, letting enter a large number of stories. Children's love, children love stories. Stories on the plants, nature. They're infinite stories and very fascinating stories. And probably they can change these young people's perspectives in their, when they reach adulthood. This is the first aspect. Another aspect that is more practical and scientific in this sense, so to speak, would be to take plants into the classrooms. I attended classrooms at all different levels from childhood and preschool even to universities in dozens of places in the world. And I never ever found a classroom full of plants. Of course, once in a while there's a vase, but that's not the point. Let's try to imagine how difficult it would be in Brazil, for example, to integrate plants and take them into classrooms, to let the plants grow in the classrooms, care for plants in the classrooms, and let watch the plants grow during the school year together with the students' growth. This would have incredible effects on the students and the children's perspectives that these living beings are sophisticated that grow, who care for us as well. This other fundamental aspect in the following sense, we know that we have to care for plants, but we don't, aren't very clear about the fact that the plants care for us. We are here because the plants exist. And the most incredible point, which relates to plants in the classrooms in the schools is that there is a scientific literature, a huge scientific literature, which states and claims that the presence of plants in classrooms has a large numerous advantages. And I'll just quote the most recent study which was conducted in Norway in a school, in a preschool, rather an elementary school from six to 11 years of age. Half of the classroom was kept as it always without plants and the other half of the classroom received plants. And they monitored the effects in three years. What they observed that was that in the classrooms where there were plants, the grades, the students' notes were 30% higher. The scholastic performance was better. The capacity for concentration was much higher. Their socialization was much, much better. 
There was no bullying or nothing of that kind. Finally, there was only half the number of sick children. So I asked myself, what other kind of solution could guarantee such good results with a cost which is so low and much high level of pleasure at the same time? With your answer, your answer is quite clear in a sense, uh, leaving little doubt about how we work so much in pedagogical terms, if on this proposal in practical terms as well. So I think that given that, it only behooves me to thank you indeed for your dialogue and your exchange, and the numerous ideas that are still with us, but I think that you who are attending FLIP, you can go into greater depth because FLIP just got started today. It's wonderful. There are a lot of roundtables ahead of us. I want to thank you, Stefano Mancuso and Evandro Nascimento, and you, the audience, and I also thank you for having invited me, and I hope that we can see each other on the screen here on the next roundtable, and we'll see you soon. Now we're waiting for you here in Brazil as well, Stefano. Thank you, Prisca. As soon as I can, I'm certain that I will come to Brazil. So thank you, one and all. Thank you, Prisca. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you very much indeed. You're very generous and kind. Thank you very much.